He's my helper. He's the God in whom we trust. He's the God in whom. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. Lift up your eyes to the Lord this morning and fix your attention on Him. He's God with us. Our help comes from you, Lord. When we need help in time of need, you are there for us. You are there, Lord, to give us help. The confidence and the strength that we need comes from you, Father.
We trust you. We're looking unto you. Though the storms of life may come, we're not going to be afraid because we have you as our focus. You are the author and finisher of our faith. He is so near to you. If you feel alone this morning, God is reminding you and saying, You're not alone, for I'm with you. I will never leave your side nor forsake you. He said, Even though you go through the waters, I will be with you. Whatever 
desert that you're in seems like it's dry, God says, I'm going to make a way of escape for you. I'm going to make rivers in the desert. It's the kind of God that we serve. Hallelujah. Our help comes from the Lord. Let's just sing it again. Jesus, you are my Father. Let's mean with our heart this morning. He's here to help you today. If you came with a need this morning, you need help. God is saying, I'm your helper. You don't have to be afraid what man's going to do to you because I'm going to help you. I'm going to be with you. Let's sing it together as a body of believers. with us. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is with us. God Hallelujah. Is with us. God is with us. God is with us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When the angel came and told the shepherds, Mary, about Jesus, Jesus means he's Emmanuel, God with us. The God who's never going to leave our side. Sometimes we think God is far away, but he's not. The Bible says that when you draw near to God, He draws near to you. Hallelujah. He's right here with us and He's going to do amazing things this morning for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's sing it. God with us. So close to us. Emmanuel. Hallelujah.
blessings overtake us hallelujah how many of you believe that the blessing of the Lord makes you rich adds no sorrow hallelujah, hallelujah. we're going to sing this song as a declaration of faith and say I'm blessed in the city I'm blessed in the field my going out is blessed my coming in is blessed hallelujah let's say it together I'm blessed God has blessed me his blessing makes me rich and adds no sorrow Amen. Let's sing about it. Blessings and more blessings overtake me. Seven away. Lord has opened. 
Let's declare this. I reign in life as a king. I reign in life Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus I'm Christ. seated in heavenly places. With Jesus Christ, my king. Jesus I'm blessed Christ. with every blessing. I'm blessed with every in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. Christ Hallelujah. Jesus. Let's be seated. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, it's a good thing for us to be gathered together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be blessed abundantly, to see the good things happening in our life because God doesn't have anything bad to offer us. He took the bad, his, He took everything that was bad upon Jesus Christ and He gave us all the good. The Bible says, though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor. That through his poverty, you might be made rich. He became sin for us so that he could take away our sin and make us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He became, uh, he went through all that pain and agony and all kinds of sickness. I mean, the sickness, the Bible records that uh, according to Galatians, it says he was, he, he was, he was, he took upon himself the curse. I like the scripture very much. Uh, and it says, <clears throat> in Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ has redeemed us 
from the curse of the law. And one of the curses that is mentioned in the, uh, under the curses, the list of the curses, sicknesses that, that are dwelling in a person's life for long years. And also it's talking about sicknesses that are not even named. Some of the sicknesses have no names, but we, don't, we just go and then we get some kind of a report about it. Let me show you the scripture from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And verse number 59. Verse number 59 it says, Then the Lord, shall, the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues and of long continuance of sore sicknesses and of long continuance. I mean, have you been suffering with something for long years? Enough is enough. Christ took upon himself the curse of the law. Long continuance. And of long continuance and sore sicknesses. And of long continuance. Once again, he says, if anything has been troubling you for too long, you've got to say enough is enough. I'm going to say enough to it. I'm going to say, Jesus, you took upon yourself the curse of the law. And this is the curse of the law. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto you. Some of the sicknesses that, that have been cleaving unto you, you got to say, enough. I don't want that to cleave in my body no more. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. Verse 61, every, and also every sickness, every plague, which is not written in the book of this law. There are some nameless diseases and sicknesses. God says, you're redeemed from that curse. You're redeemed from that curse. You can say whatever your sickness may be, whatever your problem is, whatever disease it could be, I don't care what it named. I mean, we kind of get so many names that we don't even, some of the pains and aches and all that, we don't even know what the names are really. Command it in the name of Jesus. I'm redeemed from the curse. I'm redeemed from the curse of every sickness, every plague, which is written, which is not written in the book of this law. Then will the Lord bring upon thee and until thou be destroyed. So there he, he's talking about you are free and you're redeemed from the curse of the law and you're completely freed from any destructive sickness. Be free right now in the name of Jesus and take that word into your heart and say, I've been saying, I've been trying to tolerate this for years. I've been having the long continuance and those nameless problems that I'm going through, I command it in the name of Jesus to be removed in the name of Jesus. I'm agreeing with you right now and I command those sicknesses to get out. Go out of your body in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak life and healing. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. Totally and completely redeemed from the curse of the law. You're free in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank God. We thank God. We thank God for all what God has done for us. He just laid everything on Jesus. It pleased the Father to lay everything on him, the Bible says. It pleased the Father. It pleased the Father. Because, because he wanted us to be free and let Jesus become a curse for us. Not that he was the cursed one. He was the blessed one. But he became, he became the curse for us. So we're just taking every scripture into our life and saying, thank you, Lord. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm totally and completely made whole. Let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 or 53, I'm sorry. 53 talks about, 53 talks about, in verse number 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord. Oh, Jesus went through and God says, that's my pleasure to make you free from all sicknesses. It pleased the Lord. He didn't grieve. Oh, my son. My precious son is going through, my beloved son is going through all the, he didn't, he said, I'm pleased about it because the church is going to be free from all sickness and disease. 
the body of believers who believe in the name of Jesus Christ are going to be free. It pleases me when you're walking in health. It pleased the Father to bruise him. It, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Thank God. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, and continue, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasures of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That was the heart of God. Jesus sent, or God sent his word, that's Jesus Christ, and the word absorbed. Jesus himself absorbed everything that had to happen to mankind so that you and I may be free from long, continuous diseases and sicknesses. You can say, I'm free. I'm free. Because the name of Jesus is above every other name. So though, even if there's a name or not a name for any sickness, you can say, I'm redeemed from it right now. You've got to just receive this word and say, I'm free from all sickness. I'm free from this sickness. This is not mine. Jesus has taken the price was paid. I don't, pray, I don't pay the second time for a commodity that I buy. So I don't, Jesus has paid. So I don't have to pay it no more. I'm not trying to pay. By going through the agony and the pain. Oh, I'm just going through this pain for Jesus' sake. No, not for Jesus' sake. You're going through because it's foolishness for us to go through it. It's ignorance for Jesus' sake. No, not for Jesus' sake. It's because of our ignorance. We just, want to, we just want to let people know I'm just going through all this because God wants me to go through. No, God doesn't want you to go through any pain. It pleased the Father to bruise him. It pleased the Father. Every whipping he, Jesus was getting, the Father was pleased. It was like a sweet smelling sail. I said, my people are free. My people are free. My people are free because Jesus has taken everything. My people are free. And he's looking at the church that's healed and walking in health and walking in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus, he saw something beforehand. Let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, looking unto Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him, the church, the, a joyful church that is set before him. I mean, Jesus saw the church. He saw the joyful, healthy, powerful, witnessing church, the joy that was set before him. It says, he, he's, the joy who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He just, I'm willing to take it because something that I see in the future, I'm seeing something. He saw you when he was hanging on the cross with all that pain and agony. He said, this is a price that I paid for you to be free from sickness and slavery and demon oppressions and all kinds of things that have been troubling you. He saw you. Just take it and say, Lord, I thank you. You have seen me healed. If you have seen me healed, I'm going to see myself healed. I'm going to see myself joyful. I'm going to see myself completely made whole and free and free from all oppression, from demon spirits. I'm free. If you saw it, I'm going to see it through your eyes. I'm going to see it through you. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that none of these things are going to trouble me or bother me of serving you and worshiping you and honoring you and walking the uh, walk of God and walking this life, this newness of life. I'm no longer bound to shame, but thank God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and, it sat, and sat down at the right hand, has sat down, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I finished the work. It's all over. He just seated at the throne. Now he says, you enjoy health. I paid the price. You enjoy eternal life. I went through death. You enjoy all the blessings. Everything that I've gone through was the price that I paid. 
And it's, it's a father's pleasure that I pay the price. So Jesus paid the price. It was, a, it was hurt. It was painful. It was whatever he went through. Don't feel sorry for Jesus. Sorry for yourself for not knowing the truth. And start getting into the truth and saying, God, I thank you. I received this truth. I'm so sorry that I didn't know this truth, Lord. It brings you joy. It brought you joy 2,000 years ago when you hung on the cross there. It brought you joy to see this new generation being birthed and walking in health and the strength of God. I just thank God. We need to rejoice in the Lord. We need to rejoice in the Lord and the joy that was set before him. He just endured the cross, the price that was paid in full for your, for, for your sin and for your sickness. It's paid in full. It's paid in full. Receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. We've been talking about uh, we've been talking about the image of God. God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. And if the devil has tampered something, and if the devil has done something that needs to be done to man, he has, what he has really done is tampered on the image of God. He has, he has marred the image of God because he has... He has touched the image of God. You are the image of God. Let's go to the book of Genesis. We know the scripture, but let's see it. I believe it's good for us to see some things. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. For God's, and God said, let us make man in our image, in our image, in our resemblance, just like in our figure, just like we are. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. How, yeah. Body, soul, and spirit. Let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness, the same shape and the model and the fashion that we are. And let us, and let them have dominion. I like that. He has made us in his own image and in his own likeness. If the devil has just touched you, I mean, if you want to touch man, that's the only thing he wanted to touch. That's why men, us, men and women, we find mankind on earth is filled with fear and shame because the image has been torn apart. They don't have an image of themselves. They have a very poor image about themselves. We are, we are just nobodies. And the church, in, in general, we have found that the church has embraced that wickedness looking upon themselves as sinners and looking upon themselves as unworthy, looking upon themselves as worms and dust. But Jesus came. He came back to and, and he has come back to us and he has told us over and over again. He comes and tells us, shape up your image. Change your way of thinking. You are a brand new creation. If I have come to do one thing in your life for you to enjoy this blessed future, then you've got to change your image because that is the original creation. It wants to bring us back to the original creation. And Jesus paid the price to bring us back into this original shape just like he is. As he is, so are we. As he is, so are we. We know that we saw that scripture last time, but let's go back to it in Second, First John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 16 onwards we'll read. Or we'll read a few scriptures above. <clears throat> 15. Whoso shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Whoso shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, he is the Son of God. If you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in you, and He in God. You have come into Him, and He in you. We are so caught up together. The glory of God is upon our lives. Jesus said, I pray not for these only, but I pray for all those who believe their word. And He said, the glory that you gave me, Father, I have given them. I mean, you have the glory of God. You've got the image of God. I mean, 
I mean, as the scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and God has closed that back again with glory. You got the glory of God, the shame has been taken away. When you have a bad image, you, you, you are shameful. But when you know who you are in Christ, you got a perfect image about yourself. You got a perfect image of yourself and you are no longer thinking about yourself as I'm just a nobody, I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a piece of worm, I'm just nothing. You are everything to God. You are his pleasure. You are his treasure. You are everything to him. He has come to dwell in you. He said, what kind of house can you make for me? Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house can you make for me? But as I dwell in the hearts of the contrite ones, I dwell in the ones who believe in me. He said, I want to, I want to dwell in you. And he calls your body the temple of God. Looking at the beautiful creation of, of the temple that was done in, in Jerusalem, he said, look at all this, it's going to be destroyed in a while. It's going to be destroyed in a while. But we, when we receive the Holy Spirit into our lives, when we receive Jesus, Lord of our lives, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not made with bricks and mortar. Now we are totally and completely made new in Christ Jesus and we have the Spirit of Christ in us. Born again, born again, born of the Spirit, no longer of the old. So change your way of thinking. The only way you change your image is when you change your way of thinking. I'm a new creation. And the, I'm, I'm a new creation and the word new simply means a new species, somebody who never existed before. You're, a new, you're, you're, you're somebody who is new, you have never existed before. So how could you try to identify yourself with the old creation? You, how, can you, how, can you, how can you even try to say, I got the Adamic nature? No, the Adamic nature was marred. Originally, it was beautifully created. But after the fall, the devil tampered and the devil marred the image of God. And, and I heard a preacher once, he says that, I mean, you are the image of God. You are made in the image and likeness of God. He can't reach God, so he tries to destroy the image. Like if you have a picture of somebody whom you once knew and you hate that person, he's no longer your friend. And if you have something hanging on your wall, you say, pull that down, destroy that image. I don't want nothing to do with that person. And that's what the devil tries to do. He's doing for mankind. The beautiful creation of God is being destroyed by the devil. Everything that is beautiful, everything that is good in this world, sinner or otherwise, everything that God made is very good. Everything that God made is good. But the devil has been destroying it over the years. Marred the image through media. How people are so wasted in, in their life. Nothing good in, in the lives of people. You can't trust any person because their image is marred, destroyed. They don't have a good image. They don't have that image of who they are. But the sad story is when the church, the born again people of God, who have been blood washed, purchased by his own blood, when they start looking at themselves as nobodies, I'm just a worthless person. I'm just trying to make ends meet. Well, Jesus has made everything good in your life. Verse 16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God held for us. We have known and believed the love that God had for us. We have known and we believe. God is love. God is love. He is love. That's why he's loving us. He is love. Thank God he's love. His love never changes. He, his love is not conditional. He just loves and loves and loves and loves. He's in love with his creation. He's in love. That's the reason God so loved the world. He didn't say, I'm... I'm the judge of the universe, so I'm going to send my son and teach them a lesson. Now, he loved the world. He is the judge. But God so loved the world that he gave 
gave. I mean, he, God so loved the world that he, he gave him as a prize. I'm giving him as a, as a prize to win back the world and to paint, a right, paint the right picture of mankind. God gave, didn't take back. He gave. He didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, wait, 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 wait. I made a mistake. I just have a, I got an angel who had a broken wing, so I better give the angel. I don't want to give my beloved son to go through all this. I don't want my son, I made a mistake. God never lies. He never repents. What he said, he will bring it to pass. He had been talking about it right from the beginning. He was talking about right from the beginning, from the book of Genesis, how the plan of redemption was already drawn for mankind. And his word became flesh. Everything that he spoke, in every book he spoke, he spoke the word and he spoke the word and he spoke the word and he spoke the word. He didn't contradict his word. He spoke and all of a sudden we find the word became flesh. The word became what it had to become because Jesus already confessed and spoken over and over and over and over again that Jesus was to come to bring back man to the proper image change man completely forever and we know we have known and believe the love that God had for us God is love and he had and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God do you dwell in love if you're dwelling in love he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him it is a love story actually Christians are lovable people. They're not troublesome people. They're lovable people because we are love. As he is, so are we. As he is, he's love, we are love. People try to make, take advantage of us. Well, lots of people take advantage of us, but we are still oozing with love. We forgive them. This is the last time you ever did this to me. I would never, ever forgive you no, God didn't say that. I don't say that. This is the last warning I give you. I would never tolerate you. Love oozes out of you and you just want to love people. You just want to love people. You just want to touch their lives by the love of God because you are love. You're made in the image of God and you are love. You're lovable. See, the image that people have about themselves because I'm, so, I'm a moody character. I'm so upset about things. Well, you are, God is not moody. God is a lovable person whom you can fellowship with. And you should never be a moody character. I'm just a moody character. I got up from the wrong side of the bed today. What difference does it make when you get up from the wrong or the right side of the bed? I don't know which is the right or the wrong. I mean, you better make up your mind that you don't live by your feelings and what, what people think about you. You got, you got the image of God because God is love, so are you. People take advantage from God. So do people take advantage from you. So what? You mean I find more flowing out of you. There's no lack in you. Oh, this guy cheated me. So what? Bless him. The Bible says bless those who, who curse you. Pray for them who despitefully use you. If he has taken something off from you, just let him have it. Lord, I bless that man. You said if I give the poor, Lord, because he was poor, he tried to cheat me. So I just bless him as a poor. You said that you return back to me with interest. God will pay you back with interest. I mean, God pays you interest. It's heavy interest. Heavy. Now, he doesn't go by percentage. He goes by folds. Thousand fold. The Bible records about thousand times more. I mean, the Bible says the devil steals something from you. You can command him to bring back a sevenfold. That's all the devil can give you. That's all he can give you. But when, when God blesses you, it's big. It's big. It's big. Oh, it's big. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Our love is made perfect. It is not going to be made perfect. It is made perfect. We're not living in fear. 
we know concerning the judgment day. We are not afraid of the judgment day because we have boldness. That we may have boldness in the day. Our love is perfected in us. God has created an image in us so that we are so lovable. We are so lovable. And that picture that he has painted within us and we are, we are people of love. You should be able to forgive people easily. I find it so difficult to forgive people. I don't want to do nothing. It shouldn't be a problem to you to forgive people. It shouldn't be a problem because you've got the image of God in you. Let me show you scripture. We'll come back to this. Oh, yes. Ephesians. Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll read from verse 30. Oh, we'll read from verse number 29 because I just like the top and the bottom of all the scriptures. So it's enjoyable to read the scriptures. You know, Bible reading should be enjoyable to you. Bible reading should be an enjoyable time for you. Oh, it's boring. No, it's not boring. It's boring because you're trying to understand it by the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. It's a spirit that reveals the secret, the hidden things of God. When you read in the flesh, you just try to read this as another book that is in the world. The books in the world are incomparable to the spiritual manual that you have in your hand for living the life that God wants you to live. Okay, 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 okay. This is the image that God wants you to have. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt, com no corrupt communication, worthless speaking, vain repetitions. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Your mouth is important. God speaks and people wrote. And you speak and people see God inside of you. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, to build and comfort others. That which is good. You've got something good. God has filled your mouth with good things. Psalm. It tells us in the book of Psalm 103, it says God has filled us with good things. Filled our mouth with good things. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forgive us all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Forget not all his benefits. And then he continues to say the kind of benefits that we have and don't forget them. And one of them is that he has filled our mouth with good things. Good things. That our youth may be renewed like the eagles. Let's go to that scripture. I like that scripture. Psalm 103. It's an enjoyable time for us to read scriptures. It's enjoyable. Psalm 103 and verse... One on words. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. The word blessed means to praise him. Praise. The word blessed means praise him. Magnify him. That's the word, the meaning blessed means. Blessed means bless him. We just lift up hands and we say praise you. Bless you. Praise the Lord. And all that is within me, all that is within me, we worship him in spirit and truth. Bless his holy name. He's a holy God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Don't forget all the benefits that we have. Everything good. Who forgiveth all, not a few. I like that word all. In my older Bibles, I have made so many circles in that all. I said, all, 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 all my sins, all my iniquities, all my iniquities, all my iniquities. Not one left. All. All is 100% all. Doesn't hold back a few and say, I'm going to hold you, I'm going to get you somewhere down the line because I'm holding a few grudges against you. Thank God he's not as humans. That's why the Bible says, God is not man that he should lie. He is neither is the son of man that he should turn back from his words that he has spoken to us. What he said he will do. He is not man that he should repent. He is not... He's not somebody who should repent and change. He forgives all our iniquities, the wickednesses that we have done. All. Who heals some of our diseases. Oh, you should all shout out and say, oh, preacher, wrong, wrong, wrong. You read it wrong. 
all, all, who healeth all thy diseases. You name it and you claim it. Oh, I don't believe in that bunch. That's right. That's why they don't enjoy it. So you name that sickness in the name of Jesus, command it to go. That's the way you claim it. You look at that sickness and say, sickness in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that the stripes of Jesus has taken care of all those diseases and pains. Get out now. Take your junk and get out. Forgiveth all our iniquities and healeth all our diseases. And redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies, you know, satisfies. Who satisfies thy mouth. Or you might say the goodies and the lunches and the meals that we have. No, that's much more than that. It's talking about good words coming out of your mouth. Yeah, he provides us good food. He provides us good food. He satisfies our mouth with good food, right? But then let's go deeper. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth, there's a youthfulness that is in you that does not die. That does not die. It is not limited to any age. That youthfulness that is in you. Long years back, I heard a preacher and this preacher said a wonderful thing. He said, I, I was taken up to heaven and, and he, he saw God. He said, I expected God to be some old character with a long white beard. My, after all, he is an old God. With a stick in his hands waiting to punish me. And when I saw him, I saw a young character Life was oozing out of him. He was so young and there was nothing called old. Nothing called that was deteriorating. He was surprised. He was talking about, is this God? A young personality. Love was oozing out of him. Life was proceeding out of him. Light was coming forth out of him. He said, I changed my picture about God because I really thought that God was a long, I mean, one who has a long beard, with a long hair, with a stick in his hand, waiting to punish me, but I see a young character. Good. Youthfulness is good. So there is something that is in you, which is, which is in you, that youthfulness, he would renew it over and over and over again by the words that come out of your mouth. See, the greatest temptation that man has is the mouth. Just cannot hold. I mean, what was the greatest temptation that Adam and Eve had? The mouth. They wanted to eat something that the devil was giving them. Just ate it and spoke it. That's, that, that was the fall of man. I mean, take a little child. Anything that the child says goes into the mouth. Goes into the mouth. Likewise, we need to understand that our mouth is very important and God has satisfied our mouth with good things. Good. You've got some good things that you can utter. There's a lot of bad news in the world. Why do you want to talk about the bad news? Talk about the good news. You can be a gossip, but a gossip of gos the gospel of God. Gossip is a good word in the right sense if you take it. Just gossip the gospel. Go around Gossip the gospel, talk about the gospel, talk about Jesus, brag about Jesus. Oh, Jesus went through all this. Talk about Jesus. That's a wonderful way of touching people. So who satisfies their mouth with good things so that their youth is renewed like the eagles. Thank God that God wants us to be the kind of people that are so different. We got, a, we got the image of God. We are heavenly people. We are seated together with him in heavenly places. Every one of us, we are seated together with him in heavenly places. The day that we got born again, we became heavenly people. That's why he says, you got to be so heavenly minded so that you can be of all earthly good. That's not in scripture, but I know. It says, seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above and don't get caught to the affections that are be below here. In Colossians 3, 1 says, If you have been risen with him, seek those things which are above. The knowledge which comes from above. 
the wisdom that is from above. And you start seeing yourself differently. You got a picture. You got a different picture. You, you, you got to paint that image that God has put within you. The Bible talks about in uh, Psalm 45 and verse 1. Psalm 45 and verse 1. It says, the latter part of it, it says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. My tongue. My tongue is a pen of a ready writer. What are you picturing yourself? What are you drawing? What are, I mean, you're a great designer. Right? What are you speaking out of your mouth? Is what you're designing for yourself. The image is always being renewed in our minds, in our lives, of what we speak out of our mouth. If you speak all that jargon that you see in the world, I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm getting worn out, I'm getting old, I'm tired of all these things. Well, you're painting a bad picture, you're just, you are a new creation, you're supposed to be, in the, uh, you're supposed to be speaking life, but you speak death. So you can't speak death and expect life results. You cannot say, I'm sick all the time. I get sick all the time. This is a flu season. I've got to prepare myself. Then you prepare yourself to become sick. And you've got to prepare yourself to be walking in health. There is no seasons for God. The only thing God says, my word at any season works. In season, out of season. Preach the word. So it tells us his word is for any season, bad or good. His word always works at any season. So I take the word of God at any season and say this word works. It's the same yesterday, today and forever. His words never change as much as he does not. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God himself. So there is no change. So what are you painting about yourself? I'm a failure. I didn't do things right in my life. You agitate me. You really make me, you weary me. Now why would you want to blame somebody else for your tongue? Get your tongue healed. I think we need our tongues healed so that, you know, we wouldn't put the blame on others. We would say, Lord, my tongue needs healing. And the only way you get your healing is by speaking the right words out of your mouth. Right? You speak the right words out of your mouth and say what you need to say. Going back again to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Let no, corrupt let no corrupt, worthless communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, good to the use of edifying, that it may minister law, no, grace. You should be having gracious words proceeding out of your mouth. When Jesus stood in the temple, uh, in the synagogue, and he preached from the same book they had been hearing over and over again, but when Jesus spoke, people witnessed and said, these are gracious words that are proceeding out of the mouth. These are gracious words. They were able to recognize when Jesus spoke, his words were so gracious, not judgmental, not destructive, speaking and bringing people back to the image of God. God the only thing God is doing is drawing people and causing them to change their image because the devil has changed our image over the years. And if you don't keep hearing the word of God over and over and over and over again, you couldn't prepare yourself to be that image. Let me show you a scripture. Go with me to the book of James. I'm coming back to Ephesians. I'm coming back to Ephesians. I always think we have 10 fingers so we can hold 10 scriptures at one time, which we may not be able to do it with the new technology, but we have 10 fingers, good enough. Okay, let's go to the book of James. James, 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 chapter 1. James, chapter 1. Verse number 22 onwards, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your 
own self. Yeah, nobody gets deceived. Do you know something? The preacher is not deceived. Somebody who speaks to you, the gospel is not deceived. But the one who hears, he is the person who deceives. He is the only person who is deceived. Hearers of the word of God are deceived, are open to deception. Hearers of the word of God are open to deception because they now have a choice between the two, either to obey it or to reject it. See, I can just hear the word, oh yeah, I heard a good word today. But you've been deceived. Satan comes immediately and steals the word out of our hearts. We hear a good word. I say, God, I thank you. You have redeemed me from the curse of the law, from all long continuing sicknesses. I and mean, before we leave the place, we have already forgotten the word. Because Satan comes immediately, or sooner or later, he comes and steals the words. So if you're a dece- if you've been hearing the word only, you're deceived. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. I deceive my own self. I deceive my own self. Nobody has been deceived. I deceive my own self. And the Bible says God is love and the image that I have about myself should be love. I mean, if I'm not going to apply that into my life, then I've been deceived only by hearing. I'm just hearing. It doesn't change anything in me. But you don't have to go for a new Bible. You just have to go to the same old book. And it'll give you the same message. This mirror is the perfect word. And bring it to church. And let everybody know that you are carrying a Bible. And the rest of the six days, you don't even bother to look at it. I don't think it's going to help you. You know, all that, the plans, of the, all, all the junk of the devil and the, and, and the flesh is going to come over us and, and back again our image. And we feel weary, we feel downcast, and we feel discouraged. We feel, oh... Uh, yeah, I wonder if God is God. Some people, I mean, it's, it's surprising that God never comes to you and say, I'm God. But you have most of the time you find, are you sure there's a God in heaven? When you stop reading the scriptures, when you, when you disconnect yourself, you always have questions from the enemy. The devil always comes with questions. Whenever he comes to the, are you, if you are the son of God, if is always a badge of doubt. If you are the son of God. I mean, if the devil has said, since you are the son of God, the miracle worker that the people have been waiting for, that would have been a different. If you are. When the devil comes and says, are you sure you're saved? You don't seem to be saved. There's nothing called salvation. The more you keep yourself away from the word, the more you're going to have dusty thoughts of the enemy coming into your mind. And the image has been marred. And the image has been touched. And you begin to wonder, why do I feel? I was, I was not like this. I love the Lord. I love the word. I, why? Because if you keep yourself away from this, because it says, so the secret is this. Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth, continueth, that word continue, is somebody who abides in it. I mean, this is not to be used as a guest book once in a while and say, okay, I'm present today, thank you. I mean, this is your life filled words. This is the word of God. This is how God is going to communicate to you. This is how he's going to paint the picture into you and say, you're not what the devil says you are. You are not what your flesh tells you are. You are not what your thoughts are. You are what I say you are. You are a child of God. You're healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. No weapon that is formed against you shall ever prosper. Every tongue that risen up against you you better rise up and condemn them or else they'll haunt you. And we just take that scripture, we don't even realize it's, it says, you need to condemn every thought that rises up against you, you've got to condemn. Isaiah 54 and verse 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Put that scripture up. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. 
And this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and his righteousness. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Who has planned a weapon against you? Anybody. Witchcraft, casting a spell on you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, thou, you must condemn it. You must condemn it. You must speak against it. And the devil says, oh, you've got a sickness. You shall condemn it and say, no, my body is healed by the stripes of Jesus. Oh, you got, I mean, he pinches you and say, you got this ailment in your body. After all, I mean, you got this pain in your body, so better check it out. You got to check it out first of all and say, I go to the word and I take a scripture out and I say, I condemn it. And I say, no, I refuse to accept that. I'm the heel looking for the sick that I can lay hands upon. I'm not the sick. Somebody lay hands on me. I'm the heel looking for the sick whom I can lay hands upon. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. If you're a servant of the Lord, then this is a heritage. Somebody who is in the service of the Lord, not a slave. You're, you're serving the Lord. You're serving the Lord. We, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a privilege for us to be servants of the Lord. Serving the Lord and their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. Your right standing is of the Lord, not of what you do. Your righteousness is of the Lord, not of what you do. Oh, I've been good, I've been bad, I've been good, I've been bad. So you live up and down life. I've been good, I've been bad, I've been good, I've been bad. Well, your current status is you are the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness. You have a right standing with God. You're perfect in his sight. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the mind of Christ. The Holy Ghost is in you. You're made one with Christ. That's what your image is. Your image is not what you feel. Oh, we have a lots of feelings. And those feelings are driving us crazy. And we, 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 we tend to move away because of our feelings. But by faith, accept everything that he says, who you are. So, understanding who you are in Christ Jesus. Going back again to the book of, okay, we'll let, let's go to James again. James 1 and verse 25. Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Everything that you put your hands into is blessed because you're going to be blessed in all your deeds. Everything that you do is going to be blessed because you are looking at the scriptures. You're looking at the perfect mirror, the law of liberty. The law of liberty. You're looking at the perfect law of liberty. That's the perfect law of liberty. I understand that this is perfect, it's a law, and it's a liberty. I mean, we have been redeemed from the curse of the law, but God has put the laws in our hearts now. We have a right con good conscience before God. It's not that we are lawless people. We are not lawless people. We are people, we have, we have, been, we have been given the laws of God, and they are written in our hearts now. We've got a good conscience now. We can understand yeah, I shouldn't be doing this. Perfect law of liberty. Okay. Let's go back again to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupt communication, verse 29, corrupt communication can proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Everybody who hears you should hear grace. Everybody who hears you should be able to receive grace. God has wanted every one of us to be ministers of grace. Every one of us. All who are born into the family of God, we are ministers of grace. What we say is, this is what the law says, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, that's the grace of God. That's the grace of God, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. 
through Jesus Christ. We have eternal life. We are totally new creations in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away and all things have become new in our life. So we talk about the newness of God, newness of life. We live and walk in the newness of life. We don't live in the oldness of the letter, but we live in the newness of life. Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And chapter 7 and verse 5 onwards. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. The fruits that we're bringing forth were fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. We are delivered according to Galatians 3.13. We've been delivered from the curse of the law. That being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. Now we serve the Lord in the newness of the spirit and not of the oldness of the letter. The oldness of the letter killeth, but the newness of the spirit gives life. 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 We have life. The oldness of the letter gives, life, uh, gives death. But the newness of the spirit, we're bringing forth fruit for the newness of the spirit. We, are, we, got, we got our image. The children of Israel, God was trying to communicate to them, but they had a veil always. They could not. But Jesus, the death of Jesus tore the veil right from the top to the bottom and said, God was so pleased to come out of that cage. I mean, more than we entering into him, he wanted to get out of that. Now I can face the people. I want to go and see them. I want to be in them. I want to be their God. I want to walk with them. I want them to know that I am more interested in them than they being interested of me. I mean, the Holy Spirit was caged inside, behind the, the veil. But when Jesus paid the price in full, when he said, it's finished, God the Father came and... To open that. I don't think they would have easily done it. But it was torn from the top to the bottom. And God said, I want to meet with you. I want to come to you. And God comes to us. And he is more interested in meeting with us and fellowshipping with us. Adam didn't say, oh, God, we messed up. Please come down and do something. But God, in the cool of the day, he came as usual because he wants to fellowship. God came down to fellowship. God came down to fellowship. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The final redemption is when we leave this earthly suit, which is the final enemy that we defeat and overcome. Right? So, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed you're already sealed. You cannot lose anything that is already sealed. You cannot lose your salvation. Oh, that's a very difficult subject for people to believe. They just put us off when you say, I can't lose my salvation. How can you? You're sealed under the day of redemption. You're purchased property. You belong to him. He's your Lord and your Savior. You belong to him. He has already purchased you. The day you said, Lord, come into my heart. I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that he is the son of God who died for me and he rose again. You were sealed and you were purchased. God says you don't belong to the devil no more. You don't belong to yourself no more. You belong to me now. But I free you. I want you to be led by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to control your life. God is not going to control our lives. Oh, that's wonderful. He has freed us. He has purchased us. But he's not going to control our lives. He is not going to control our lives. Don't ever blame God. God, you've been controlling my life. God never controls us. If you want to sin, you sin. Somebody will take that up and say, yeah, that's what he said. If you want, you may sin, but it's not God's will that you sin. As much as it's not God's will that you be sick, and it's not God's will that you be poor. It's not God's will that you be oppressed by demons. As much as sin is, sickness is. God doesn't want you to live in sin. He doesn't want you to be a slave no more because he, he released you from slavery and he made you a son that you may serve him honorably before the Father. Serve him gladly. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God 
Thereby you are sealed on the day of redemption. Let all, verse 31, let all bitterness, not a few of them, all bitterness. I got a few of them. No, no, God says all bitterness because there can be many areas of bitternesses that we have. Now, I'm not bitter towards this situation, but I'm bitter towards that situation. I'm not bitter about this person, but I'm bitter about that person who has influenced this person. All bitterness. All bitterness. So it means all. I mean everything. God, when God talks, he wants it all. He doesn't want a few things. Now I don't mind everything is okay, but it's, it's this thing that I, I'm holding a grudge against. I mean everything goes with me, but I don't like this. I don't like this person. I hate him. Don't tell me to love him. But you've got the image of God to love that person. God is love, so are you. God is love, so are you. You are love. You're a lovable person. Just because you're lovable and people take advantage of you, don't get upset about it. That's okay. Let them eat the fruit. You're producing fruit. You have love, joy, peace. Fruit is there for people to enjoy. They just enjoy you. I mean, they enjoy being around you. They're supposed to be bearing fruit all the time. You're abiding in him, and he abiding in you, and you begin to see your fruit bearing. So people enjoy the fruit around you. I mean, this guy is an easy guy to move with. That's right, I'm an easy guy to move with. I'm not a difficult character. I'm not somebody who's hard. It's not, it's easy. <coughs> Things are made easy for us. You can easily move with people who are not proud-hearted. And God is not proud. God, he says, I'm meek and I'm lowly. Come unto me and I will learn of me, he said. So you've got to be meek and lowly. You don't have to be arrogant. Even to share the truth, you don't have to think, I'm the only one who has this truth around in the whole world. I got something that nobody has. Well, just be humble enough, just like Jesus. Come unto me all of that. Land. I mean, children were willing to come and sit with Jesus while the disciples shooed them away. And Jesus said, come. The children, I mean, children, don't, children love the presence of lovable people. People, children, they don't want to go with people who are having a bad day. He's got a bad day. He's got a boy, bad mood. I don't want to go close to him. He might just pounce on me. I don't want to get close to him. But Jesus was such a lovable person that the prostitutes thought that they had a right to come and wash his feet. And they thought they had the right because, because they never saw such a lovable character. The sinner women, people looked at this woman as a sinner woman. I mean, the, the, the religious people, they said, if Jesus is a prophet, he can recognize that this woman is a sinner woman. But Jesus was so lovable, he was the image of God. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Likewise, you can see you can also come to the position of somebody might say, oh, no, wait, wait, wait. You can't say that to us. Well, the Bible says that. As he is, so are we. As he is, so are we. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Oh, that's too difficult. That's too hard. Well, Jesus said it. He was the son of God. Who are you? Who do you think you are? You're a son of God. You got the spirit of his son, you got the Holy Spirit in you. Let people see you. You got to just clean up yourself a little bit. Go to this mirror and flush some of those bitter areas in your life so that you can be a lovable character. And we think, well, I think, uh, how can I be? How, can, how could I ever say, if you're seeing me, you're seeing the Father? I am not Jesus. Well, you are the body of Christ. What difference does it make the head or the body? I mean, you look at the head of the person and you say, I like to fellowship with the head of the person. When I see a person, I see the whole body. When I see a person, I see the whole body. I just don't see, can I just fellowship only with the head, please? I don't want nothing to do with the body. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love thy neighbor. So you are the body of Christ. The head is perfectly fitted. So when people see you, they see Jesus. Ah, oh, I find it so difficult to understand this. 
You, I have never fellowship with the head. I've always fellowship with the person, the body. I, I fellowship with the body, the whole person, the head and the body together. So if you see me, you see in the Father. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby your day read on. Uh, okay, we'll read verse 31. I'm just going scripture after scripture and going back to the same scripture over and over again. Okay, let's just finish, wind it up. Let all bitterness and wrath, all bitterness and all wrath and all anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Put it out. Get rid of all that junk. So that you, that image will be so clearly seen. I want people to see Jesus in me. One guy told me, he said, you look like, you talk like Jesus. I said, thank you. You never said that I talk like the devil, at least. I said, thank you for the compliment, because that's who I am. Oh, you, told, you speak too much of scripture. With Jesus spoke all scriptures. A preacher who was interpreting for me some years ago, he said, uh, let me analyze and tell you exactly. I mean, I was an interpreter and I was, uh, your, your, your lesson was too long. I mean, generally we, we speak for about 15, 20 minutes. Jesus spoke for hours and hours and they, people were staying there. And, and they finished all what they had brought while they were eating. Jesus said, now the disciples said, now it's evening, it's it's dinner time. They have been having their lunch and their breakfast here, listening to your sermons. It's dinner time. We'll send them off now. They don't have anything to eat. They have, actually, the original says they have nothing more left to eat. I mean, they just packed all their food parcels and came and they were eating while they were listening to the word. And then the disciples, they found that it's going to be too, it's, it's night time now. Send them away. Send them away. And Jesus still said, Ma, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just starting this thing all over again. I'm just preaching this thing. Paul was preaching and one guy fell off from the window, who was seated in the window, raised him up from the dead. I mean, they, they had no problems at times because they knew that this word paints an image of the perfect picture of who God wants you to be. The more you keep hearing the New Testament, the more you keep hearing the New Testament, you begin to see you're being, you're being changed into the likeness. You're already changed, but you're just taking those little, little things off. Time to time, we have these things coming out of it. Okay, quickly, quickly. I'm just closing. I'm closing. I'm closing. I'm sure going to close. Verse 32. And you be kind one to another. Kind. That's an image that you have. You're, you're supposed to be a kind person. Kind. Be kind one to another. Tender hearted. Oh, you can be easily touched, tender-hearted. Not a difficult character. Oh, I'm just a very difficult character. I'm a very, very difficult character. No, you shouldn't be. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You can forgive them. You can forgive them. You can forgive them for all what they have done. If God wants to come to us and show us of all the mistakes that we have done in the past, we will say, oh God, have mercy on me. Oh Lord, you know everything, Lord. After all, oh yeah, yeah, God said, I know everything. If I were to bring up everything of your past, what would you say? You just bow down and, oh please, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. You know, this, the, the story about this king and he had this one of his servants who had to pay him a large sum. And he went to the king and said, oh king. And when he was caught and he was about to put in prison, he said, oh king, please forgive me. I'll, I'll pay you. I'll pay you. You know, that was the biggest problem he has. I'll pay you back everything that I have done, that I have taken. I'll pay you back. So the king freely forgave him. I don't want to be paid. But in his heart he said, I'm going to pay this king back again. That's why we, some of us, we can't forgive others because we say, we think we can pay God for what he has done for us. So when he went back, he was trying to go for all those who have cheated him so that I can collect those monies and go and throw it to the king's feet and say, king, here's the money. I suppose I'm, I'm, just, I'm just putting this through. So he went to the guy who had to pay him a very small sum, caught him by the neck and said, you've got to pay me all. And when the king's servant saw this and brought to the king, the king said, I forgive you all this. 
I forgave you all this. I just can't believe that you're doing a thing of this nature where you, somebody had to pay you a small figure compared to what I have forgiven you. Compared to what I have forgiven you. And he said, you shall be put into the torment. I mean, I mean, let me tell you one thing. If you're not willing to forgive people, you're going to be tormented by demons. The tormentor is going to torment you. God said, he washes his hands off. He said, I'm sorry, I can't do much. If you can't forgive, I'm taking my hands off and let the tormentor keep tormenting you. I mean, he just does not torment you. He can put sickness into your body. He can put financial problems into your body. If you don't forgive those who have wronged you. Because it says, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, for because of Christ hath forgiven you. You know what? Jesus hung on the cross and in the last words that he said, he said, Father, forgive them. Was he referring to the Roman soldiers? No, he was referring to the sinful generation that Adam has brought forth. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's our sin that put him on the cross. It is we who took the nails and put him on the cross. It's our sin that put him on the cross. He didn't, just didn't forgive those Roman soldiers there. He said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. But I'm doing a good work here. I'm destroying the works of the devil. I'm destroying through death that I may destroy the one who had the power of death. That those who were subject to bondage of death are freed from this day forth. I mean, Jesus did a marvelous work. So it says, as he has forgiven us, so we forgive those. I can't forgive them for what they have done. But if God turns around and says, I can't forgive you for what you have done, where do we stand? Where do we stand? Oh, I don't have a tender heart of that nature to forgive people and let them take advantage of me and let them use me as a rug. I don't want to. I don't want to be taken advantage of. We have taken advantage of what Jesus went through. We didn't go through all that agony for all what we did. He paid for us. So forgiveness is very important for a person's life. And, and forgiveness should be a norm in our life. It shouldn't be, oh, it's so hard for me to forgive. Talking about forgiveness, I get so mad. Don't talk about forgiveness. I can't forgive people. That's not my nature. Uh -uh. When you say that's not my nature, get born again. It's not my nature to forgive people. Get born again quickly because you are heading towards hell. Your nature is to forgive people. Your nature is to forgive people. You got the nature of Christ in you. So you don't ever turn around and say, I don't, uh, that's not my nature. By nature, by nature we were, I mean by nature, it's, it's all our fleshly emotions. It's not, it's not the nature problem. My nature is already changed. I, got, I'm, I have a new heart and a new spirit within me. God took the stony heart out of me and he gave me a heart of flesh. It's not the problem with the nature. It's my emotions that I have no control of. The Holy Spirit inside of you keeps talking to you and saying, don't, don't, don't harbor bitterness. Forgive them. Don't get angry. Forgive them. That's why we have the, we stay under the umbrella of grace. That even if our emotions plays up, we thank God for the umbrella of grace that the wrath of God cannot come. We thank God that we are under the umbrella of grace and not under the umbrella of law. We thank God as much as he has forgiven us, so we forgive others. Final scripture, 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, verse 16 and 17, we know, 16, we know, we have known and believed the love of God. We have known, we have known and believed the love that God has for us, for God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So when you're walking in love, when you're dwelling in love, God in you and you in God, you're just intermingled together. You don't tell God, please come down. You're already 
in God and God is in you, yeah, there's, there's so much of a oneness between the two. Verse 17 says, wherein we have, wherein our love is made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because, why do we have boldness on the day of judgment? Because, because as he is, so are we. As he is, so are we in this world. God is not hate. God is not unforgiving. Jesus is not mad with people for all what he, has, what he went through. He is love. As he is, as Jesus is, so are we. As Jesus is, so are we. As Jesus is, so are we. He's not mad sitting on the thro throne room of God. Or he's in God. Fire, send down fire. Let there be a tragedy in that family. Lord, these Roman, the Roman Empire, they did bad things to me. These Pharisees, fry them, Lord. You know what? He's seated at the right hand side of the Father and he's interceding. Father, forgive them. Lord, uh, this man has to be saved, Lord, and, and, and he, he brings a preacher across or brings somebody across. He's just interceding. His work is not finished. Although he said the law is all over and it's finished, his work is not finished. Hebrews 7.25 says, He ever liveth to intercede for us. He's interceding. Father, forgive them. Lord, don't hold them back for what they do, Lord. Help this person, Lord, that he may or she may come into the right place and uh, have the right relationship and fellowship with me so that I would be able to talk to them. And, you know, God, there's, there's a communication that is going on and the communication of love and intercession that is going on with the Father. He's here at the right-hand side of the Father interceding. Interceding that we might be saved to the uttermost right until the end that we would finish our course, that we would run our race and say, thank you, Father, for helping us we have a great intercessor who intercedes for us. He's interceding for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the image that you're painting. And Lord, for the mirror that we have before us that we can go and take away some of those flaws out of us so that we would be people of honor and glory as you are, so are we. So that we can move around with people so easily and talk to them and meet with them and they would say just like the people of Antioch we know of one Christ who talks like them who spoke like them who did things like what they do that was Christ so we call them Christians little Christ we we'll call them they're like that same Christ went about healing the oppressed, went around giving the gospel, forgiving those people around them. Oh, we praise you, Father. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the love that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, that we could forgive those people who have wronged us, we're not going to be mad with them because you were mad with Jesus and your wrath came upon Jesus and you took that madness out of me so that I might be a child of God like father, like son and I'm not going to be different to you Lord when they see me they see you I pray for every person here and all the viewers that there will be an enlightenment, a revelation that will come into their hearts that they, are, they have been torn apart. The image of God is torn apart in their lives. That there are corrections, there are things that need to be put, put in order. That they need to go into the perfect law of liberty. That their lives will be changed. That they will start altering some of these things that need to be altered. And they will see themselves as you see them. Son, you be as I am because that's what I made you to be. 
God so loved the world, you so loved the world. Jesus dying on the cross, forgive, so must you forgive. Forgive. Forgiveness is not reasonable. Anything that God tells you to do may not be reasonable. See, we try to live by our reasonings. We think this is a reasonable thing. If I get mad with the person, I'm going to teach him a lesson. We look at Jesus and see it was not reasonable for Jesus to become sin for us, for our sins. Everything that God has for us is unreasonable in the natural. Why should he heal us? Why should he forgive us? Why did he send Jesus? Unreasonable. Why was an innocent blood shed for wicked people? That we would no longer reason with God to live like him and talk like him and act like him. And we would say, in the eyes of God, through the eyes of God, in the realm of the spirit, it is the most reasonable thing that I do. It is the most right thing. Every reasonable thing is not right. I would say, it's a right thing for us to forgive those who have wronged us. Love those who have hated us. Move into their lives with no fear because perfect love has cast out all fear out of your hearts. You're not afraid to move around people that they might step on your toes again. You can say, no, my toes have been healed and they are made out of brass now. Nobody can step on my toes. That's the image of God. They can't hurt me. I got the spirit of comfort in me. I got the mind of Christ. My body, the temple of God. If they can penetrate through this body, they have to go to the mind of Christ, which is in, which is in me. And if they can go through the mind, they got to they gotta deal with the Holy Spirit who's inside of me. So I'm going to put a stop from my temple itself. No hurts, no wounds. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's what Jesus said. You shall tread on serpents and scorpions. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. So get out of this hurt. I'm so hurt. It's my emotions that have been a hindrance to me and my, between me and my God. Your emotions can change. Stop being hurt. You are made in the likeness and the image of God. As he is, so are you. Hallelujah. Let's partake in the covenant meal.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Put all that weight out of you. Instead of carrying all that load of bitterness and unforgiveness that has caused you to live a very weary life, that has opened doors for the enemy to torment you, to blind your mind, that you may not be able to see things as the Spirit wants you to see. And one of the meanings of the word blindness, the Bible talks about, we can be blind that we have forgotten of how much He has forgiven us, how He has purged our old sins. In Second Timothy chapter 1, it tells us we have forgotten of how much He has forgiven us. And we are blinded. And one of the meanings, I believe in the word, it means that I can be proud. That blindness is reference to pride. Pride is no good thing. It is a fall of any man. Pride is a fall of any man. So God says, don't be blinded or don't be proud hearted. Forgive those. And learn to forgive. Even, I mean, let, let this get into you. They'll know. You'll know for sure that they'll make the same mistake against you again and again and again. But still you forgive them. And Jesus was approached by the disciples and said, how many times should I forgive my brother? He said, shall I forgive him seven times? No. Jesus said, 70 times seven. That's 490 times for a day. I don't think you have found a person of that nature who have gone against you for 490 times a day. But the standard of God is the same to you and to him. As he is, so are you. You should be willing to forgive them 490 times a day if they do things against you. Heavenly Father, I pray for your grace and your love that has ministered to us this day, Father, and strengthened us and you're perfecting that image or you're, you're bringing us into the place where you're showing us what it means to walk in perfect harmony and unity in the Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, as you are, so are we. And as we partake in this covenant meal, which is precious to us, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He has forgiven you and healed you of all your sicknesses. Has forgiven you and healed you all. Forgiven all your iniquities and healed all your diseases. Forgiven all your iniquities. All. Healed all your diseases. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We honor you this day with our tithes and our offerings. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You said, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure. That the windows of heavens be opened unto them. As they purpose in their hearts and their brain. Honor them, honor their faith, and bless them. Hallelujah. 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 He's been good to us. Not one thing has failed of all the good things the Lord has spoken. He's going to bring to pass everything that He's promised. Let's thank Him for those.
praise. We honor you in this place. We thank you, Lord, for all the good that you've done for us and each and every one of us. We have honored you with our tithes and our offerings. You said, given it should be given unto you. Said, Lord, the windows of heaven. You, Lord, you have promised us that you will rebuke the devourer. And Father, you said that we have enough and more to give to every good in all things that you have abundant supply. That's your word. So, Lord, we thank you according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus that you would meet them. And Lord, I thank you wherever they are, Father, that the windows of heavens are always open for them. They walk into the situation and their needs are met. And they'll have enough and more all the time that they would always know for sure that you're there on time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and see you next week. We also have the evening service at 5 o'clock.